Okay, um, so my name is Zane Sullivans, and I am the chief data wrangler or vaquero de datos uh, for Catalyst Cooperative. And I'm going to talk about um, public utility data sets in the US, mostly related to electricity, but uh, more generally for energy. And I definitely want to acknowledge my partner in crime, uh, who's not here with us today, Christina Gosnell, who has really been a co-equal partner in this process for more than five years. Um, and she's actually the president of our little um, employee-owned consulting co-op. So you can follow us both. <coughs> So I came, I came to this work from kind of a weird place. I, at least I think it's a weird place. I, I used to work on space exploration and I went to grad school originally because I wanted to terraform Mars. I you know, read some science fiction books by Kim Stanley Robinson and was like that, I'm gonna do that. Screw this boring tech job in Silicon Valley. Um, and I you know, successfully got in and started working with NASA data and ended up you know, working on Mars, working on the icy moons of the outer solar system. And then I took an atmospheric physics class and realized that actually we were already involved in a terraforming project. It was just on the wrong planet and also in the wrong direction. Um, <clears throat> and I kind of had a meltdown and decided that after finishing my PhD in like a pit of despair, I wanted to actually work on addressing this problem. Um, so I went into climate and energy policy after graduating. Since you're here, I assume that you also like data and probably also live on Earth uh, and you know, may have an interest in similar topics. So data people, when we talk to data people, they often think like, wow, you know a lot about electricity. And we, when we talk to electricity people, they're like, oh, wow, you know a lot about data. Um, but really, we're, we're just stubborn amateurs on both sides. Um, and it, that combination is valuable. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of people that are aware of like the policy and advocacy universe and also the kind of data and um, coding universe. So we're, we're trying trying desperately to kind of bring these two groups together. So I'm, what I'm hoping um, we and maybe you will get out of this talk is we, we want more data people to understand what energy and electricity data there is um, so that we have more people kind of informed and playing with it and doing interesting things with it. Um, and we also want to get more activists and policy um, involved people literate with the huge data sets that exist and that could help inform their work. So I'm very interested to talk to somebody from the Carpentries about setting up another domain specific kind of track for um, this kind of basic literacy for working with data. We also really need help. It's blank. Yes, it's supposed to be blank, yeah. Um, <laughs> just so you know, stripes. Um, we also need a lot of help telling these stories. And we haven't been able to make any good connections with data journalists yet that want to work with data on energy and climate stories. So if anybody you know, has connections like that, we would love, love to know more. Um, so I don't know, d does anybody recognize these stripes? Do people know what this is? This is a color-coded um, time series of the average global temperature on Earth starting from 1850 on the far side to uh, the present on, on this side. So it really, there's some crazy stuff happening right now. And I, I periodically feel as if I am a space explorer who has been marooned on a planet with you know, a civilization that doesn't know what it's doing. Um, and then I talked about humans in the third person. <clears throat> So this is from uh, Ed Hawkins and the Climate Lab book, and he has lots of great graphics related to this. So who here has been to a public utility commission meeting or hearing? Oh my god, that's great. That's usually the answer is zero. This, so this is where the magic happens in the US um, as far as um, deciding what our energy system looks like. Uh, it looks like a bunch of lawyers, because it is a bunch of lawyers, and it's a, basically a, court, a courtroom-like proceeding in which uh, typical utilities um, come in and say, we want to build these things, we think people are going to use this much energy, and we think we should make 11% return on the you know, billion dollars we're going to invest. And you get into a very adversarial kind of conversation with you know, discovery, collecting data, making um, cases against each other, and that the utilities really have a very, very unfair advantage here. They have a huge information asymmetry. They have all of the information about their system. Um, they have all the resources in the world um, to throw at it. So every proceeding will typically have its own team of attorneys that doesn't have to work on anything else. Um, whereas on the advocate side, you know, you're probably working for some scrappy nonprofit or maybe in the public sector and, and maybe, you know, there are eight proceedings going on simultaneously um, in conversation with the same utility and they have eight attorneys on every one of those eight proceedings and you have the same attorney who sleeps on a couch in a basement who's trying to like coordinate all of those things from the other side. Um, <clears throat> 
so this this asymmetry really leads to some problems as far as um, the equity and you know you know reasonableness of the decisions that get made sometimes because the PUC you know they're actually they're not often they're not domain experts in this and they certainly aren't um, you know fully briefed on the opaque models, um, the proprietary data that's being used to make the case from the utilities point of view. And when they get some like, you know, wild-eyed hippies on one side and a bunch of suits from the utility on the other side with apparently all of the data and the expert witnesses getting paid five hundred dollars an hour to testify, they typically are like, hey, you know, the utility probably knows what it's talking about. We're gonna go with their suggestion. You know, and what could possibly go wrong? Um, <clears throat> So these are some of the things that can go wrong. This is just in the last uh, couple of years. And you, know, you can see we're not talking about chump change here. This is real money. Um, you know, South Carolina has, has decided to just totally bail on a nuclear plant, $9 billion in the hole, literally. Um, there is this, you know, the first kind of at scale carbon capture and sequestration plant uh, in the deep south, um, $7.5 billion. They've totally scrapped it. Um, and they're, they're now being sued uh, by the DOJ for fraudulent use of uh, federal loan guarantees. And these are, you know, these are spectacular failures where they're actually getting some comeuppance. And um, in South Carolina, typically a fairly conservative state, the legislature wants to rip the face off of the CEO of that company and they're actually gonna you know there will be consequences but this is atypical you know usually they get away with it they you know convince the PUC that what they want to build is a reasonable thing they pass the cost through the ratepayers and you know these nine billion dollars seven billion dollar piles of infrastructure are what you're paying for in your your monthly bill um, <clears throat> so we're never going to be like I, I doubt that we'll ever be able to produce data and models that are on par with what the utilities have but I don't think that that actually matters so who who recognizes this guy does anybody recognize this I'm probably gonna date myself here um, but this is, this is Hank Paulson the Treasury Secretary under Bush the second um, <clears throat> and he presided over the the mortgage implosion uh, a decade or more ago and um, you know was he incompetent did he not understand how markets work um, no he understand very well how markets work because he's also Hank Paulson CEO of Goldman Sachs um, the problem here isn't that he didn't know what he was doing the problem is that his interests and motivations and affiliations and um, you know his really allegiance was maybe not to the public interest um, so you can be the best in the world at what you do and if you're you know you have the wrong incentives the wrong motives or the wrong interests it, it doesn't matter how competent you are and conversely you know if you get people in the room with the right incentives and you know at least a little bit of, of material to work with you can make real change and I'll go through some examples of that uh, later on places where this has been successful or where it could be successful in the future um, so our origin story, you know, we, we all started at this tiny little nonprofit called Clean Energy Action. It was basically unstaffed, um, and we got very familiar with the Colorado utility landscape. <coughs> and um, as a result of that, we were invited to help with a foundation project to um, understand the finances of their coal plants. And it went well. You know, we understood, you know, how much it cost to generate electricity from the coal plants. It was clear that it was more expensive than building new renewable facilities. And the foundation, which for some reason wants to remain nameless, um, was like, that's great, do more of that. We'd like to do 10 or 15 more utilities. But um, we had scraped all that data by hand from PDFs um, and from crappy spreadsheets, and we're like, ooh, there's no way. We're not doing that by hand. Um, we'd rather just do it generally for all of the data, for all of the uses that anybody might want to you know, use this for. And it seemed like at the time, in a kind of brazen act of hubris, that that would be about the same amount of work. Um, <laughs> so... The nonprofit that we were working for, they were like, eh, that doesn't, that's not grassrootsy enough. It seems kind of arcane. We're, we're not really into that. Um, but there was a $70,000 grant on the table to do it. And we're like, well, we would like to do that. So we're going to spin off our own little thing um, that's called Catalyst uh, to do this work um, on our own. And so that was our first kind of foray into trying to rectify all of this horrible data. And what's my time? I didn't start the timer. OK, great, great. Um, so yeah, so we're really a pile of activists that have, you know, self-familiarized with the policy universe and also with the data universe and the tools that are necessary to work with the data. Um, <clears throat> and so now I want to talk a little bit about what is the data? You know, where does it come from? What's inside there? 
why is it maybe interesting and something that people should be paying attention to and playing with. Um, so most of the data we work with comes from the federal government, from these different agencies. Uh, and this is like scattered all across the, the huge government bureaucracy. We've got the Department of Interior, um, which controls both EPA and the Bureau of Reclamation, which does a lot of hydro projects. Um, PHMSA, which probably nobody's heard, part, heard of, is the Pipelines and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, part of the Department of Transportation, EIA, and FERC, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Those are both part of the Department of Energy. Um, we've got the Department of Labor with the Mining Safety and Health Administration, and um, the castle in the corner is the Army Corps of Engineers, Department of War, I mean, Defense. Um, and you know, together, these agencies have mandates, legal mandates, typically, to publish vast quantities of data. And you know they do that, but often the mandates are not specific enough to really make sure that the data comes out in a way that anybody wants to use it or is able to use it. And that's very frustrating. Um, but a really nice thing about this is it's all public domain. Anything that comes from the federal government, you can just do whatever you want with. Um, it's it's yours, yours to play with if you can get it out of the box. Um, there are other big sources of data too. Um, this is a map of the ISOs and RTOs, which are the independent system operators and regional transmission operators um, or regional transmission organizations. These are the people, the organizations that run the grid in the, the colored areas here. Um, and typically they operate in places with competitive markets where, you know, at least in theory, the people that are generating electricity are competing um, with each other to do that cheaply and efficiently. The, the beige areas are a mix of kind of traditional monopolies where you have, uh, as in Colorado, where we started doing this work, um, somebody with a government mandate to provide electricity and a basically a guaranteed rate of return. And there are all kinds of interesting problems that come along with that model. Or public power agencies, uh, like in the Pacific Northwest, the Bonneville Power Authority. Um, and in the Tennessee, you've got the Tennessee Valley Authority. You know, these kind of almost depression era, large public power um, associations that are truly public entities. So their data is often quite clean and very accessible. Um, but the ISOs are not, gov they're kind of quasi-governmental. Um, they don't really um, l land in the public sector. So they have, they all have their own licensing requirements. Um, it can be very challenging to get them to agree to let you kind of officially do stuff with their data, but it's all, it's all available. It's online, it's, it's there via APIs, and it's terabytes of information. Um, so, you know, these people publish every five minutes the prices and um, a bunch of other interesting attributes about electricity at about 13,000 different locations um, across the US. So that, that piles up very, very quickly and also gives a kind of an insanely detailed picture of what is going on with the electricity system day in, day out, um, every five minutes. How much does it cost? How much is it gonna cost tomorrow? How much does it cost? How much is it gonna cost tomorrow? Who's producing? What kind of power are they producing? Where is it coming from? Where is their congestion? Um, all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to just note like a little bit about the data sets that um, these folks produce. So um, EIA is kind of a creature of the Carter administration and does a pretty good job. It loves Excel spreadsheets. Almost everything is in an Excel spreadsheet and they change format every year. Every year has a different Excel spreadsheet format and they have like 15 tabs and no NA values and like all of the wonderful fun things that I'm sure everybody in the room has dealt with at some point. Um, but they're, they're the good kid. Um, so FERC, FERC is, is especially FERC Form 1, um, is just, it's an archaic um, DBF file format. So it's a, it's a binary database format that is undocumented. You know, they don't give you a schema for like what the database looks like, what the name of the columns are. Um, we wrote a scraper that s greps the binary files for strings so that you can, you know, then associate the, the names of the columns um, with the data that's in them. Um, but it works. And we actually had um, somebody we were working with who had been nominated by Obama to be the chair of FERC, who was like, oh my God, you have the FERC Form 1 data? I've, I've always wanted to access it. Um, you know, so the, the potential chair of FERC, who is a former regulator in Colorado, couldn't access the FERC Form 1 data. So, um, you know, that's ridiculous on, on, on the one hand. But on the other hand, like, once you break that out, you're the only one that has it, at least in the civic sphere. And people are very, very excited to, to get access to it finally. Um, EIA gives a lot of information. This is a lot of financial information. Um, EIA has a lot of financial information, also some operational information, you know, about coal plants or you know all kinds of power plants, where do they get their fuel from, how much did it cost, how much electricity did they generate, um, that kind of stuff. 
the PEMSA data is the, the stuff that we're interested in is about natural gas pipelines. They, you know, every every year they get a report from all the natural gas utilities about where are the pipelines, how long are the pipelines, what are they made of, how old are they. So you can you can you know guess at when the pipelines will need to be replaced, and if you don't want to replace them because that's a you know climate changing piece of infrastructure, you know what your kind of timeline on that is. Uh, the Bureau of RAC and the um, Army Corps are all about hydro from our point of view. And then MSHA has data on um, mine production and safety stuff. So that's interesting in a bunch of different categories. And there's also there's a lot of economic information in here about what communities will be impacted by changes in the energy system. So like people that depend on mining, that depend on power plants for the tax revenue for their county. And it's like 90% of the property tax revenue for the county and they will implode when you shut down the coal plant, um, which is important from a political point of view and also a kind of a human decency point of view. Um, oh, and just the, the scale of this, like all together, there are, there are billions of records. You know, maybe it's 10 billion, maybe it's, um, it's probably on the order of 10 billion records between all of this and several terabytes of data between all of it. Um, so it's not, I don't know if it's really big data, it's kind of medium sized data. It's definitely annoying to work with um, on a laptop. Um, and once we kind of integrated the first 100 gigabyte data set, we're like, this is not going to be a laptop thing anymore. What do we do? And had to start exploring out of memory computation and um, other things that we really still don't have any idea about. Um, or, you know, if you don't want to deal with all of that, you know, difficult, tedious data munging, you can go to S&P Global. Um, which will, you know, for $20,000 a year, give you a subscription to a terminal that has most of that data and they've done cleanup and they've interpolated and filled in blank values and it's, you know, relatively easy to use but aimed at kind of a Wall Street market. So it's not n even necessarily the right thing um, for advocates to use or policymakers to use. And also it's totally opaque. Like they don't give you any information about how they clean the data or what their model was for interpolating or filling in those NA values. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and, and they they have a very traditional platform monopoly business model, and every time a new small startup is founded to kind of do the same thing, they buy them. Um, and they've been very successful in the North American market at just pretty much completely controlling access to, to this information. Boo. Um, okay, so what, what can we do with this data? If it's available um, and usable in the public interest, what kinds of things are possible? So um, does anybody recognize this dam? Probably not. This, this is a local project, so this is the Lower Snake River. Um, so it's I don't know if it's in this state or but you know it's it's flowing into the Columbia. And you know several years ago there were people being like you know do we really need these dams? We'd like to restore the salmon run. Uh, maybe some of them should be removed. And the utility was like no 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 you can't remove the dam. We need the dams. The dams are very important and they produce three gigawatts of power. Um, you know and to replace that with another carbon free power source would be very expensive. You wouldn't want to do that. And typically, in a utility commission, they'd be like, well, I guess we can't replace the dams it's, or take them out. It's too bad. But um, Northwest, what's it called? Northwest Energy Coalition actually had data from the um, Bonneville Power Authority in this case. And they, they could see the generation that the dam had put out for you know a decade or more. And, they, and they, it was clear that this was a bluff on the part of the utility, um, which is a public entity. So it's, I'm not totally sure what the incentives are there that make them want to keep the dams in place. But um, the dam, on average, over the course of the year, only generates about one gigawatt of power. Um, and you know, in reality, when when the Northwest needs the power, when the power is is demand is high and supply is low because there's so much hydro up here, it's only generating 500 megawatts. So you know, a factor of um, a factor of six different, really, um, functionally, from what the utility was saying. And uh, you know, so this kicked off a whole like new environmental impact statement process. Um, just and like how many bytes are there in the data that they, they use to, to make that case, you know, for not maintaining infrastructure that costs a quarter of a billion dollars a year just to maintain um, and instead to explore, you know, other zero carbon um, opportunities in the Pacific Northwest. You know, it, it was, you know, a megabyte or a couple of megabytes of data um, that they happen to have access to because it was published as a CSV file by a public agency that cares about data. Um, another example, so this is the thing that we started working on, um, <clears throat> okay, five minutes. 
which is you know looking at the economics of coal plants in Colorado um, in 2013 we realized you know based on data that the utility had submitted that the coal plants were no longer economic so at that point we didn't have to argue with the utility we could just be like hey look the thing that you already submitted says the more renewable energy you add the cheaper the electricity gets so that was a relatively easy case to make we still didn't win um, <laughs> but it did inspire m people to get involved in like trying to more quantitatively make these cases and change the utility's mind. And finally, you know, six years later, um, just last Friday, the Colorado le legislature finally passed um, a bill that will allow these coal plants to be refinanced and shut down, um, you know, very early and also some very aggressive climate goals. And we've been kind of providing data to the people doing the analysis behind this for, um, for like five years. So it's very gratifying to finally, finally see something um, work out politically. Um, this is complicated. I'm going to skip it. Um, another another kind of project that we're kind of interested in doing going forward is the EPA data um, says how much power every power plant produced every hour for the last 20 years. So you can look at, um, and this is a graph of a particular power uh, plant put together by Joe Daniels, um, and the blue is profitable, the red is not so profitable, the yellow is startup and shutdown costs, and you can see like they're operating in the profitable regime and then occasionally not, but that's because they have these, these startup and shutdown costs. Um, but if you were to put a renewable energy source in the same location on the grid, the generated power at zero marginal cost, so like every additional kilowatt hour is free because that's the way renewables typically work, um, and you, you made it compete with these power plants when they would be profitable, maybe you could force them offline purely economically um, by strategically locating renewables um, nearby. And that's, that's interesting because it then opens up um, transmission capacity, which is a, um, a limiting factor for, for many you know, places uh, now as renewables get get cheaper and cheaper it's not cost it's like well what do we connect it to um, <clears throat> so you know th there's there's these terabytes of data we're trying to break them out um, and put them into the you know real functional public domain um, and even if we we're successful at that which you know hopefully we will be um, over time this problem isn't going away like it's only going to get more complicated because um, the, the amount of data that's necessary to run the electricity system is growing exponentially because you have people installing batteries, because you have electric vehicles charging, you have dispatchable demand for electricity where the utility can be like, no, 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 don't consume now, okay, now consume. Um, and instead of having a few thousand entities nationwide that are trading electricity um, and, and putting it onto the grid, you might end up with a few million or even you know, if it's at the device level, a billion devices in the US that are interacting with the power system and the markets that have been constructed um, to, to serve the power system. And you know that, that's going to be truly, truly large data. Um, and they're starting to roll out kind of trials of this kind of stuff. So there's a group at Berkeley that's been uh, deploying uh, sensors that take two measurements um, or 120 measurements every second, so twice the frequency of the kind of AC circuits. And they can do things like um, when, and you, I'm sure you're all aware of the fires in California due to PG&E and some other uh, power line failures, the system can sense that there is a broken wire, and before the wire has hit the ground, it can de-energize the line. And it, it, can, it knows that it's broken, and it can you know, prevent that fire from starting, because it's you know, at 120 hertz, it's checking in on the system. Um, and, and yeah, that's a huge, huge amount of data. And you know, people are working on how to visualize that. And um, the markets that are built around this are, you know, they're going to be another opportunity for a different kind of electricity monopoly, a different kind of platform monopoly. If we don't really do a much better job at understanding um, what data should be public, how it should be publicized, and and how people can work uh, and should be working with it. Um, so we're hopeful that this, this project will lead into, you know, kind of a deeper discussion about the future of energy data, electricity data, and um, how we can avoid that kind of captive uh, environment in the future. And I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip these kind of pipeline questions. This is our original pipeline, MESS, PANDAS, Postgres, uh, Jupyter, but it turns out Everybody just wants to download a CSV, um, advanced and beginning users. So eventually we went to MESS, Pandas, um, and we're starting to implement data packages instead. And then like, okay, whatever you want. <coughs> um, 
Okay, 30 seconds. <laughs> and thank you to all of the organizations that have supported us um, in the past. So.